Now, what I thought we might do for a little bit is to have a bit of a bit of sharing and questions, and particularly if you've got questions for Andy uh, or uh, or Doug, they know the answers to everything. <laughs> so, uh, that, uh, that, that, but feel free. So this is it's on the schedule. It's a panel discussion. So it's it's a the panel is I think me and Doug and Andy since we said it all. So, um, but you can share anything you like as well. So this is a bit of a time for some sharing, questions, ideas, comments, and the online um, community are going to be hopefully posting some questions. And Desmond is going to do his best to uh, put some of them maybe even up on the screen. We can incorporate that as well as we go along. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think for the sake of answering the question, so the online people can hear, yeah, they need to be hear through so this. Right. Yeah. I have a roving mic here as well. Wow. So if you ask questions this week, it becomes a view. Okay. Although we don't need roving <laughs> questions. <laughs> My first question. So, uh, yes, so Leon can bring the microphone to you so that the people online can hear, right? So. There you go. Well, we can it. just repeat it. Okay, so, uh, yeah, any thoughts or questions? Or, Sandra, do you want to kick off? Yeah, I'd just like to... Oh, oh sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh. Okay. okay, sorry. Yeah, hi. Yeah, thank you so much, guys, for this. This was really encouraging. I just felt like we were able to share without judgment and just really listen to each other. And I thought that was really, really helpful. And what you guys shared as well. Um, I just, I think the question I have, Malcolm, is more for you. Um, in, in your discussion questions, you said, who is or could be your teaching tribe? And I just wondered, um, what kind of characteristics would you um, say would be good to look for in a teaching tribe? Would it be people who are... I know you mentioned about mm. not being like you, but just wanted a bit more help just to break that down to understand how you would be able to identify who your teaching tribe would be. We didn't get that far, sorry. I think if I think about the Apollos group, let's put it it's simple to think about it like that. So about two years ago, I was feeling I was feeling lonely. Oh. <laughs> no, I know. It sounded, <laughs> it sounds a bit uh, no I so um, Penny and I were getting on totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> But I was feeling that lack of, in the teaching space around me, that lack of companionship and com comradeship. Mm. And people like Doug just were across the pond. And uh, so, it, I was, what can I do about that? And just what, as I prayed about it, what came to mind was people that I felt I connected with on the level of enjoying talking about scripture on a deeper level. Mm. And people who'd already done things that I respected. They'd taught, they'd written, um, they got involved in helping situations, including, you know, your good husband. Uh, and that kind of made it obvious. It, it wasn't difficult. In fact, it was harder to keep the group relatively small, because I knew it couldn't be too big or it would be unwieldy. So there were some people I thought of, including Nobody in this room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, be careful. I can see. Well, it was accurate. But no, I, you know, I had, I had to sort of restrict it a bit because yeah. of just numbers. But um, it wasn't that hard. It was people who were already having done things that I respected mm. and had that kind of passion for God's word. Mm. I don't know if that makes it any clearer. Yeah, it does actually. Good. Yeah, yeah. Got one person in mind at the moment. Yeah. Well, thank you. 
Want to answer that? No, no, let's get, let's get more questions. Okay, all right. Let's we'll move that up. roving microphone around the side and behind there. There we go. Uh, yeah, so our movement has a history of a bit of tension between leadership and teaching. Mm. Uh, I was wondering how you think that um, we should navigate that in now. Uh, and yeah. Navigating the tension between leadership and teaching. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But in a lot of places, the leaders are the teachers. <laughs> yeah. So you're, this is where you're talking about places where there's like a divide well, somehow. Where there's a kind of, you know, par parallel, there's not a group well of people interested in teaching. I mean, let's say the, in my situation, I'm not a leader, but I do a lot of teaching. There's tension in these leadership that hard people. <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> but, I mean, you've had decades of this, Doug. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the adjective in the title of today's event is helpful. And helpful means you communicate. Uh, if there are significant others in the crowd and you have a very significant idea, it's probably not the ideal, not ideal that they're hearing it for the first time as everybody else. <laughs> but you're staying in, in touch, bouncing ideas off. Um, well, that's incredibly important. A lot of it's just uh, communication and, and, and respect. Mm. Sometimes you know your idea is different. This is not what we normally do or teach, and this may have a certain effect. And, mm. But some people kind of <coughs> revel in rocking the boat, the shock effect of ideas. That's not the way to do it. Mm. I'd say. No, I totally agree. I mean, I, I talked about being a boundary pusher. You shouldn't be a pushy boundary pusher. <laughs> um, you have to push boundaries sensitively. Um, I've had a lot of these kind of discussions about a whole bunch of what might be perceived as quite controversial issues, issues about race, issues about the role of women in the church. If you just bound into some context and write here are my ideas, rip up your rule books and here's the new law, then you will just alienate. Um, and historically, there have been tensions between, you know, elders and evangelists and teachers. Those those tensions do exist. I, mean, I don't think Simon's not inventing this idea. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, but again, I would, I would totally agree with Doug that the, the key is communication. Ultimately, we all have the same goal. Um, and I think if, if you can articulate that sensitively, then you know, as long as as long as people are open to ideas, you just discuss them. Um, and, and if if those discussions don't work, <laughs> um, I think I would, I would take Malcolm's advice. Find your tribe. Have those discussions with like-minded people and see what the spirit brings from them. Yeah, that's, that's where the Apollo spirit came from. So, Yes. Yes. I, I think I'd say, I'd say two things, because it does vary from congregation to congregation parts of the world. Um, I would say, firstly, to, on the teacher side, prove yourself useful, because yeah, a, a helpful voice ultimately can't be ignored if it's actually shown to be helpful. So wherever possible, if you have a teaching passion or gift, try and find a way to channel that into something that's useful locally. Um, and the second thing is, um, I would say build build a relationship wherever possible. I think as you already mentioned, it is a lot of this is relational. And maybe try and build a relation a relationship to the point where you could ask this question, but not necessarily phrase in this way, which is what are you afraid of? Because whenever there's tension, it's to do with fear. Yes. Yeah. And that fear may legit be, may be legitimate on some level, but it's still a fear. And anything that's driven by fear is ultimately, potentially, it's unhelpful ultimately. Yeah. So try to get underneath the fear. If there is tension, it's probably because of the fear. 
People may not admit that it's fear. So you're saying, what are your concerns? No, I just, I'd say, don't phrase it like I'm phrasing it. But I, I think that's that's well, often what's underneath tension in those situations. Okay. We can just throw it. Thanks, thanks for the class. Excellent. It's more general question, alluding to something you mentioned earlier, Malcolm. I was here last year at the Beatitudes class, which is great. But in between that time, about a year ago and, and now, I hear from speaking to different people in the grapevine of different similar or smaller events or, that have happened in different parts of, 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 of the church in the, in the general sense. And how, how and my fear is, my fear is that, um, I, but I don't hear about them until after the event, right? And I say, wow, I wish I was there. I would have, I'd love to hear about that. Could be in the East, could be in the South. So which, how, whose newsletters do you receive every week? <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> I do get yours, actually. But, 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 you know, but, you, but for example, your news there wouldn't tell me about a couple of events that have happened in the East in the past that, you know, I, I didn't hear well, about. That's fair. Or maybe they happened in, in the South or something like that. You know, forgetting, you know, the, putting aside uh, virtual and boundaries as we, whatever we do, we must be able, I, I don't want it to be this time next year before I, I attend something like this when there have been other events that happened across the church. So how do we, how do we cross those boundaries? I don't know, but I, I, I don't think it could be that difficult. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, Malcolm has, it's a weekly newsletter. Yeah. And you talk about things. So yeah, but, but how, many, how many people in the London area would you need to touch base with every now and again, so that you would be informed of pretty much anything that was going on. Yeah. Of course, if, if the websites are maintained and up to date, you can visit the church website. In my experience, many church websites, last updated, you know, 2019. <laughs> <laughs> you click on calendar and it's empty. Yes. And I know that's not the case, but it's gonna be a combination of things. But I think you can, we can figure it out. It's gonna take a little bit of time yeah, there might be the uh, might be logistical questions. Maybe people who are doing things might have to think about in terms of how they publicise and advertise things. That, 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 that maybe that question. But again, I think you know there aren't that many degrees of separation. I don't think you have to be connected to that many people to know most of what's going. To, of what's going to, you're never going to hear about everything. There's all sorts of yeah, things going on you that you're, you're bound to miss. But I think if you're reasonably connected, you'll hear about enough. Of it shouldn't be the case that you go a year before you find out how I miss part of the things going on. You know. I miss, I miss, a lot. I miss at least ten percent of the things. Mm. Going yeah, on. but that's okay. You can't go to ninety percent of the things anyway. But you need to hear about them. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth, it's worth thinking that well, about worth thinking about uh, it. Yeah. I made that. You and I can come up with the answer later. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to be answered here. It's just good for thought for the yeah. future. Thanks, Leon. Yeah. Get, get, the guy get, get your own microphone. <laughs> with your own question. So I guess my question is, um, how do you, as teachers, how do you determine what should be taught? Is it like a field of dreams approach, build it and they will come? Is this the second <laughs> question here? <laughs> no, no, this is my own question. Um, okay. uh, or, or, you know, sh should it be, should there be an attempt to focus on particular needs or demographics within our congregation of people we know? Or is it kind of a combination of the two? How to decide what to teach on. Yeah, and what should be taught. Because, I mean, I, I think, sorry, let me just follow that with some context. I think, for better or worse, teaching can be seen as a intellectual pursuit. And I think that that can alienate a lot of the people that it can it actually can help when we, with our teaching. When we have teaching events, it's like, okay, there'll be these people there or those people there. And it's rather than, it's almost like focus towards certain types of people rather than certain types of needs, is would be my observation. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Mm -hmm. And the three of us probably share a common bias, a high <laughs> tolerance for lectures, uh, 
you know, the massive reading. <laughs> That's not the way most people are wired. But I, I think as a teacher, the most important thing I do is teach Bible. I do, do I do church history or maybe some intricate doctrines or faith and science interface? Sure, I do lots of things, but it's, Bible's first and foremost. I mean, that's, that's number one. And if we'll do that, that'll strengthen the ministries we're part of. But that'll take away a lot of attention, and it is incredibly practical, this, this book. So to me, that's, we're given freedom. We're not really told how to do it. Timothy was to devote himself to the reading of scripture publicly and then to teaching and preaching, which means that he was preaching the text he had read. Not he read a few scriptures and then he had his agenda, <laughs> the exegetical control. Yeah, I guess there's two, I think there's two kinds, there's at least two kinds of events. I, I think there are, are if you're talking about events as opposed to regular congregational teaching, I mean, that's a different question, perhaps. But if you're talking about events, I think there are the events which are really for everybody, um, where you might teach on Philippians or something, and I think that, that should be something that every Christian, young or old, can enjoy and find nourishing in a spiritual sense, and that, that's something very important. Um, and then there's the other events, where you need to get people together who, who are willing to have a bit more of an intellectually challenging, stimulating time together to dig a bit deeper. So the balance of those two is important. Yeah, I'd gently add to that as well. The, the other thing that perhaps determines what we teach is just being sensitive to the zeitgeist, what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. you know, the whole reason that you know, we engaged with the race question was because it was being taught. Now, mm -hmm. race has been an issue since the beginning of time, yeah. um, but obviously it flared up in the last yeah. year for particular reasons. Um, and there are other situations like that, which people in your congregation will ask questions about, right. and mm -hmm. they won't be happy with pat answers, um, and they won't get the answers from you know, Sky News. So, so they'll, they'll want to know, this is what I think does, I think again is important. The question they're going to ask is, well, what should we as Christian people do about this? Does the Bible have something to say about its Y or Z? And so that partly um, leads where we go. Um, but the other thing, I think we'll go back to what I said before, is that we've got to kind of, we've got to learn to teach our story. Part of what I think dictates what we teach is, the world is fallen and God has acted to put it right. What's he done and how does that affect societies? You know, there have to be some, 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 some bigger rubrics around how we think about what we teach from the Bible. You know, um, as I said, we, we all have a, a strong passion for this book, but you know, I, don't, I, I know one zillionth of what it says. You know, there's, there's no way to be able to go through every single thing. So we have to sort of apply some kind of wisdom, and I think part of that wisdom comes from well, what is our story, what's going on in the world, how do Jesus and his followers um, speak to their vision? Good, good. Um, Lola, and then we'll do a couple from online. Yeah, Doug, you, you, you painted a picture of, you know, from Crossroads, Boston, ICOC, how biblical training has sort of been weakened. Yeah. Um, and do you see that changing, or is anything? Do you see, see any movement? What, you know, across our sort of churches in general, any development? In, the in right a lot direction? of places, a lot of church leaders are taking seriously the need for biblical training. Right. I mean that they need biblical training, and and then continuing education, not just okay. I got a master's degree. No, you need. Need to need training every year, not just a few classes. It's days and days. Uh, so that is changing, but in most places, it's not changing. Right. I'd say by far the majority would say, "Why do we need training? I know what the Bible says anymore. Then why would I need to look at history? We just follow God. We don't need to know the past." That's still 
that kind of naive view is still the dominant view, but it's not everywhere. Uh, there are a lot of places where, um, you know, people realize we, we need some training. In the past, we've been way too far to saying just the Holy Spirit and the Bible is enough. And, and we underestimate what the Lord did those three years with his apostles. We, it's like we ignore the fact that he was teaching them not just scripture, but how to use the scripture in different situations. Mm -hmm. It was all Bible. They were learning a ton of Bible. So we've excused ourselves. Um, but it's changing, but I, I think it's only changing in some places. I wish I could say in, in most places, mm -hmm. honestly. Yeah. And it's, it's the same pattern in the larger evangelical world, things getting dumbed down. <clears throat> and Andy as a university lecturer, I'm sure you could speak to that, but this is uh, the wor world we live in. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I lecture in a place which doesn't have a confession as such. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, but you're uh, very well connected. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so in, in, in that sense, yes. Um, what God shared about our sort of history of, of, mm. uh, of teaching in churches is much the same across the denominational world. Right. Um, in fact, if anything, I'd, I'd say yeah. the evangelicals maybe even, I mean, this is not to, I'm not going to pick on any people who well, I kind of am, but the, the, <laughs> the evangelicals are perhaps becoming more biblically literate now. Right. I think they would have admired some of our older passion, perhaps, in mm -hmm. days when things were, were stronger. Right. Um, but uh, but, but it, it, it's a bit more complex than that. But, but yes, it, it, it's true across the domination. It's not just us. It's interesting because the Churches of Christ were known for many decades, mm. generations, as people who held the Bible in high regard, they knew yeah. the scripture, mm. do not talk to one of their ministers or even one of their Christians who's been around for a few years because they'll win the discussion. People will be warned, don't talk to them mm. because they know their Bible so well. Mm. But often it's the opposite now. Yeah. Sometimes even, oh, they're, they're guys, they don't know any Bible. They have no heart of any Bible at all. Mm. Which is, I, that makes me feel very bad. I wasn't brought up in the Church of Christ, but still it's my adopted church. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions online I, I can see on the screen there. Um, please elaborate a bit more on my question four, which was about how to find your teaching tribe, I think, intercongregationally, outside your own congregation. And maybe what I said to Sandra might have answered it, uh, that. I, I think you're looking again for people who just share the same kind of passion. Uh, if you've got more detail on that question, let me know whoever was asking that. Hmm. The second thing there, is a teacher expected to teach everything the church needs to understand or should each teacher focus on some specific topics? Mm. Mm. It's gonna depend on the church and depend on the teacher. Yeah, mm. Mm. yeah I mean, I, I was talking to Doug in the car yesterday that I picked up at the airport. That I, one of the things I enjoy about our teaching today at least from, from my perspective, is that Andy and Doug and I are so different. We're, I mean, we have some things in common, for sure, but we are very different personalities and different styles of teachers. <laughs> <laughs> different body shapes and different... <laughs> and there is something very valuable about that, mm. even just in that. You know, different people teach with different gifts or different styles, and we need a variety. Yep. Um, and I'd say if you're a small congregation, that's probably uh, w one thought would be is helpful to get some people in. Because if you're in a large congregation, you've probably got some resources of some variety. If you're a smaller congregation, maybe less so. You might want to think about uh, getting people involved from other places. Um, anything else you want to add to, no, no. to that? Not really. But in these days of Zoom, mm -hmm. It, it's very easy to get people to, if you want outside voices, to get brothers and sisters from other countries. Mm. And, and normally people don't charge anything, it's free, it's easy. Yeah. Yeah. 
easy to do. Um, what do you think about that top one? I'm, I'm just going to milk and meat. What's that about? Well, it says when I was baptized, a lot of mature disciples felt like the teaching was all milk. In other words, they thought it was too simple. Right. Now, I feel like it's all meat, which is it? actually I doubt because I, I don't know any meat. church that is all meat or could even digest it unless you mean by meat boring stuff, yeah. which would be like, you know, I'd be like a child saying having a steak dinner is boring. <laughs> How can we find a balance? The both are being fed. And, and I think when we teach the word and preach the word and stay with what's here, not importing our agenda, that will meet the needs of the young and the old. That'll meet needs of people who need the milk because there is milk. There's simple truths, but they're also profound. You can have meat and milk coming from the same passages in the same sermon, yeah. in the same class. Yes, yes. yes. absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, a lot of that's about actually being trained as a teacher. Um, we need to learn from each other because some of us are better at some things than others. And that's where this collaborative thing comes in. If you're better, you're great at the meat but not so good at the milk, then find someone who's good at the milk and learn from them. I mean, it, it, it become more skilled. Teaching is a skill as well as a gift. Yeah. So um, I would say add to the skills. If if a steak, I mean, if you're vegan, I'm sorry, but if, if a steak... <laughs> I just was grabbing something. If, uh, if a steak doesn't taste good, it's the chef's fault, not the problem with the steak. The that's cal cal that's right. deep. Yeah. Right. You should write, write that down. That's <laughs> right. Right. It's Absolutely. It's not the cow's fault. That's right. It's, <laughs> it's not the cow's fault. That's right. It's, it's the no, chef. That's absolutely right. So there's nothing wrong with the deep stuff and powerful stuff in the Bible. It's more the way, you know. It's I, served, yeah. If my congregation are bored, it's my fault, okay? I'll just say that, Akin and Stephanie, you can hold me to that, Desmond. It's not from on. too much meat. I, it's, it's probably from a lack of meat. Maybe, I, you know, but that, right? But even when you have meat, I mean, I think these carnival metaphors get a bit, bit fun, but, but even when you have very deep stuff, if it's not explained in a way that people can understand, yeah, yeah. then yeah. It, it's pointless anyway. In, in, it's yeah. not just depth for the sake of depth. It's, it's got to mean something to yeah. people. And you, you, you have to account for different levels of education as well in a, in a yes. congregation. Not everybody is... And, and you know, English not being first language. It, it, precisely. For yeah, there are yeah. all sorts of considerations. Even for many um, people in America and England, it's not the first language. <laughs> <laughs> we're trying. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, we're killing the English language. <laughs> um, young people. Good question here from someone called Alex. Um, how can we help younger people to explore learning about faith for themselves, not just accept what they're told? I would hope older people wouldn't also just accept what they're yeah, told. Yeah. But, um, question about younger people. Hmm. It seems to me the younger people uh, are already figuring it out. <laughs> they all have their favorite podcasts, and um, they're very... Sometimes they're way ahead of older people. Yeah, that's true. A lot of the reading suggestions I get or podcast suggestions are from people who are half or a third my age. They're just more tuned in. But that's like saying that's not a valid question. I'm not trying to say it's not a valid question. I, I think, I think from a, as an older person, <clears throat> I have to admit these days, I think my responsibility is to 60, ask, yeah. ask younger people what they think and create yeah. a space. And, Engage in discussion, not just telling, <clears throat> and asking and learning collaboratively and valuing their opinion and are taking it on board. I mean, they have a different experience. Just because someone's 20, 30 years younger than me doesn't mean that their opinion is less valuable than mine. Um, so I think it comes down to that sense of respect. You know, the teacher has got to respect those that they are privileged to be allowed to teach. Mm -hmm. And it needs to come across. So questions is a big part of it, I would say. Someone I respect, well, he's my age or just over. Last week, he asked a 30-year-old to mentor him. He didn't mean help me with my grandchildren. That it was help me culturally, help me to be, as I explain things, uh, because they, they work in the same company, uh, if I'm doing something wrong, please let, let me know. There's got to be that kind of openness. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, we, twice we, his age, and he's asking for help. So. We're close to one o'clock, so uh, yeah, we are. 
Any burning question? Um, Jack? Yeah, can I, because I was asking the same question actually, kind of similarly to that second one there on the screen. I mean, they've acknowledged sometimes there's a fear of taking things out of context, teaching them accurately. You want to do a good job when you're opening the scriptures. Mm. <clears throat> You've referred to this uh, idea of collaborative teaching as well. And I just wondered if you have any tips or advice on good process, or perhaps you've seen healthy functioning teaching ministries where collaborative teaching is done well, and what they do to, to really help, help that go well. So it's a forward looking thing. I'm not part of a process. I would say, and I'd, I'd be interested what the two of you think, I, I think there's a process way of doing that, and then there's a cultural atmosphere way of doing it. And so it depends a bit what's going to work for you and your congregation. So there are congregations that have teaching committees and groups, and they meet and talk about their sermons ahead of time and that kind of thing. I think that's fine. There are others where I think, at least for myself, I don't have that. But I would like to think that in engaging with people in the congregation talking, that we are refining each other. And so, where, but it has to be that it has to be a cultural thing where it's, it's something you value. So it, it could be more formal, or it could be more just a cultural thing. I would say. Mm -hmm. I, I used the phrase before a naive view. I was referring to history and Bible. A, a part of the naive view of inspiration is that you don't need to interpret scripture because it what it means is obvious. If you have a good heart, you'll understand it, and you'll always agree with someone else who has a good heart, who reads the same scripture. And that view is just false. Mm -hmm. I think we need some basic training on how to interpret. And the rules for how to interpret scripture are the same as they are for interpreting any kind of literature. Right. You know, from the author to, to the intent to the literary forms, and it may sound academic, but without some training, and you hear words like hermeneutics and exegesis, without that, we're gonna make a lot more mistakes. So if you want 12 hours of DVDs on that very issue, <laughs> I may give that to you later on, just see that. <laughs> but you need training, you need classes, you need to read books on it. If you've never done that, then it's time for that to stop. You need to read some books or get some training in how to interpret scripture, the basic principles. We won't all, agree on everything, even if we do, but we'll be speaking the same language. It'll be much better, more productive interaction and more respect. Fair? Absolutely, and that's why I said at the beginning that it is a time investment. Uh, if you're scared of taking things out of context, you have to learn how to put things into context. For me, this didn't happen by osmosis. It happened because I sat around people who had been doing this stuff for years. And I'm not saying everyone has to go to university or seminary like Doug says, there are plenty of resources available, mm -hmm. but you've got to equip yourself. You have to take it that seriously. Um, and, you know, we're, we're not going to agree on everything. And even there are different books on hermeneutics who disagree on how to interpret. You know, even the methodologies that you use to interpret uh, the Bible, there, there, there are disagreements about that. But there has to be some fundamental training. Some of the technical jargon needs to be broken down you have to have at least some sense of the tools that you use. Yeah, the goal of that isn't to agree. No. Right? In fact, we shouldn't all agree on everything. If we do, there's something's wrong. Yeah, <laughs> if we yeah, someone's something. not thinking. Yeah. 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 Okay, we probably best wrap it up. Mm -hmm. um, a few closing announcements and bits and pieces. Do you want to talk about books and so on? No, if you do. Okay, whatever. We'll just, go, we'll just do it in order, then whatever we need to say, we can say. Okay, doke. So um, the last page of your handout is, or the booklet, is a, uh, a feedback form. So we'd be grateful if you have time even today, scribble down some ideas and tear that off and leave it behind. That'd be helpful. If not, feel free to take it away and email uh, me uh, via the email address that's on there. Uh, so that'd be very helpful. Um, I'd be really interested in particular to know what you think about similar events like this in the future. So what next would be helpful? Um, we do hope, plan, not hope, we are planning on establishing the Athens Institute of Ministry UK and Ireland 
chapter, stream, no. channel, I don't know, uh, for uh, in, in the new year. So it'll be more like Easter now. We were hoping earlier, but I think it'll be Easter. So you might be interested in signing up for that um, if you want to do something more formal, uh, which is deep, but not too academic, I think, right? You'd, you'd say? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's maybe one or two terms of work university level, but done over several years. And um, Andy and Alka and I are going to meet in three weeks with uh, Dennis Michelle, Valerie, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Dennis and Michelle. Yeah. Yeah. And this is an example of that kind of thing. This is a number of different teachers um, on a topic. And again, working together like that, having dedicated time can really be valuable. But that's, a, that's something that will well, we have to figure out some of the details, but probably Saturdays, a number of times a year, and a great way to learn. So, yeah. So, Doug and Andy and I will be the primary teachers, but we'll have other people involved. Sure. Uh, according to specialities and things like that. And uh, more details, you know, have a chat with me or, or Doug, really. And if you go to the Athens Institute of Ministry website, you'll get a picture of it sort of from there. Athensinstitute.org. There you go. Um, right, books. Doug has brought some books. Yeah, they're back. And he doesn't want to take them back to Scotland. Not really. Um, so, uh, some you're giving away, those little ones. I've already given away. Given those away. Yeah. If you haven't got your free copy of Rethinking Church, definitely grab it. Okay, that one's free. Then, um, there's some, uh, uh, it's not Black Friday today, but it's sort of... <laughs> 60, 65% off. Yeah. Okay, a, a big discount. <laughs> on a number of other books, uh, which are over on the table at the back there. How do you say you those? Anyway. Yeah, any, anyway. Okay. And if you haven't already done so, I would recommend signing up to Doug's newsletter. Um, thanks for promoting this, actually, on your newsletter. I Doug. did, yeah. And if you haven't been on a tour, why not go on a tour? Uh, uh, Penny and I went to Israel two, three years ago, and we're going to the Mediterranean on a, another biblical tour. Paul's prison journey. That's it. I just got back from Turkey, where Paul spent most of his ministry. The majority of Paul's ministry was in what is today Turkey. It's an amazing country. Israel coming up in February. I just want to plug that in the sense that for me, you know, being physically in these places, it's a big thing. And some of us have had that privilege. But and a lot of us here, I can see are in a mature time of life when uh, we might be able to postpone buying that car for another year and instead use the money to go on a tour. So why not, all right? Get some, make some great memories in these biblical places, except you're That's going to the nice. airport. Oh, apart from that. <laughs> that. That's gonna make a difference, yes. The heating. By three. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, well, I think it'd be really good to pray. I wonder uh, if Chris, if I could ask you, would you mind praying for us? Thank you. Well, thank you so much for uh, this morning. Thank you to Andy, Doug, and Malcolm for all their quitting and for all they contribute personally to helping disciples in this country um, better understand the glorious gift that is your work. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to come together with like-minded people. And uh, I pray that there, there will be some fruit come from this in terms of um, collaboration and uh, building teaching relationships so that we can um, improve our own understanding and also um, through teaching improve and uh, encourage others through, through the teaching that we're able to deliver. Thank you so much for um, bringing us all together on this occasion. Pray for the food that we're about to enjoy. Thank you to uh, Penny and, uh, and anyone else who's uh, put in the, the effort and uh, thank you to um, the people who run this church for their hospitality and their friends being here. Thank you again, Father, and uh, I pray this for all bear fruit in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chris. Enjoy your lunch, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.